Do I love this show? Yes. Is this an excuse to watch it again? Also yes. Hello everyone, I'm Kevin. I am a Swedish upper secondary school teacher and I teach both Swedish and English. Today I'm going to react to uh, Young Royals. I have watched Young Royals twice, so this will be the first time that I watch it. But this is the first time I will watch it with English subtitles. Young Royals is a popular Swedish TV show and it follows the royal family. So we have Wilhelm, who is the youngest sibling in the royal family. So he is a prince and because of something that happened in his old upper secondary school, he has to switch school to Hilishka, which is this boarding school and kind of like in for upper class Swedes. So the main thing of this show or the main issue, the main conflict of this show is the fact that the prince Wilhelm falls in love with a guy. And that is, of course, very problematic. And that is a huge issue when a member of the royal family is something other than straight. And this show is getting a second season, so I thought it would be a lot of fun to react to with the subtitles in English and see what things, um, words in Swedish that are untranslatable and see how the interpreter translated those words into English from Swedish. I'm going to watch the first two episodes and see if there's anything with the translations that I would want to discuss. And I actually got this idea from this screenshot and mainly because we don't have that word in Swedish. The word crush, there is no word for it in Swedish. You know, they feel like you have a crush on someone. We don't have that. That is a word that we don't have. So I'm very curious to see what the word is actually in Swedish that was translated into a word that does not exist in Swedish. The show is also set in an upper secondary school. And as I said, I am a teacher at an upper secondary school or I am an upper secondary school teacher. I will also react to those parts. If there are anything connected to the upper secondary school system or teacher or anything like that that I want to discuss, I will do that as well. And I hope that you find this video both entertaining and educative. And so let's start watching the first episode. Okay, um, in Swedish with nicknames, nicknames should always be at least two syllables. It's very weird to have a one syllable name like nickname. If you have a one syllable name, your nickname will usually be two syllables. For example, the name Carl. The nickname for Carl is Kalle. And in this case, we have the name Simon and his nickname is Simme. And not, you know, like in English, you would say maybe like Sai for his name, but we don't really do one syllable names because in Swedish, it flows better to have two syllables, usually with a double consonant sound and usually a vowel that is E, but it can be another vowel. Sebe, Basse, Jonte, were like those are common nicknames. So it's usually two syllables with two consonants in the middle and then ending on a vowel. That's the most common Swedish nickname. I just wanted to point that out because it can look very strange if you're used to English nicknames that usually shortens because it's easier in Swedish, it flows better in Swedish to have two syllable nicknames that are that way than in English, it might be more easy to say a one syllable nickname. For example, like the name Christopher in English, it would be Chris usually, but in Swedish, the nickname for Christopher is Krille or Stoffe and that those are both longer than Chris. So, focus. Um, so I just wanted to mention a little thing. I come from a similar place as Simon. So what they're talking about, like it being more diverse, like the town that they live in is more diverse than the school, of course. I don't have experience with that kind of boarding school. I've never worked in a boarding school. I've never gone to a boarding school. We don't have a lot of boarding schools in Sweden. And this boarding school doesn't exist. It's a fictional boarding school. It's a very upper class thing. Everyone is upper class. But this kind of place that Simon comes from, that's very similar to my background. I come from um, a place in Sweden 
that is known to have the highest amount of people with immigrant background. It's famous for it. Now you could probably mention this, the city name or the big town, I guess, a small city, I guess, depends on how you see those things. But that's where, that's where I come from. I come from that kind of background. So I'm very, like, I relate a lot to this whole thing. Like, my family was very different from Simon's family in, like, how we acted. But I do really relate to that whole situation. Okay. I feel like I should mention this as well. This is not representative of upper secondary schools or schools in Sweden at all. Most schools in Sweden are not religious at all. I think, especially like upper class, I think religion is a little bit more important. And I'm not saying that as kind of like everyone in the upper class is like that. I mean that more like richer schools they tend to have these kind of, you know, ceremonies at churches. For example, like um, the ceremony before winter break, you can have that in a church. Or before you go on summer holiday, you can have that kind of celebration at a church. Not every school has that. I've never personally known of a school that does that, apart from like smaller schools in more religious areas of Sweden. And as I said, like I come from a very, a very diverse, like the norm in my town and at my school was to have immigrant background, which made it so that a lot of us with immigrant background identified with all of our nationalities. And it is definitely something that has affected the fact that I identify as Swedish and German because it was normal to do that. This th whole thing with like saying grace before you eat and the whole thing in like the church choir, like they were the school choir, but it was in a church and you know the religious aspect of it is not a representation of sweden as a whole and not swedish schools like in sweden we're actually not allowed we're not allowed to connect school to religion unless you do religion as a subject when you do religion as a subject you're allowed to discuss religions you're not allowed to give your opinion that we because i'm a christian we're only going to talk about Christianity for a full term and then the rest of the religions we should go through. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to put your own opinions or religion or anything like that. You're not allowed to be subjective when you teach and we're not allowed to have like prayers. It's not mandatory if you pray. There are in some schools a prayer room that you can go to if you need to pray for specific times or anything like that you have in some schools a room for that usually in bigger schools you can have a room specifically for prayer i know some teachers who have had that uh, muslim teachers who have been able to have like a prayer room for the different times they should pray and there are christian schools in sweden i know we have a christian school uh, in my city uh, we have multiple but we have one specific one and with that school you can have a prayer time before the first period but it's not mandatory if you're not a christian you don't have to do it even though it is definitely a good thing if you join those prayer moments or that time when you do a prayer before starting class as teachers and as students. But as a whole, we separate religion, any religion, from the school. But it's also worth to note that the royal family are the only ones in Sweden who do not have the right to choose a religion. Everyone else in Sweden have a right to choose their religion. Was it Nicke who bought out to you on my summer? And that's where I said, like, Mikke is Michael, or Mikke in Swedish. And Stoffe is, as I said, Kristoffe or Christopher. I 
that's another thing. The royal family are allowed to vote. They have the right to vote in Sweden, but they never vote for the reason of being impartial. So even though they have the right to vote, they decide not to vote. It's not the same thing like, as I said, with the religious freedom. They don't have religious freedom, but they have the freedom to vote. They just decide not to. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, I just wanted to like, because they translated to cute, that's why. Okay, so the word that he said is snig, and snig is not cute. Cute in Swedish is söt. So if you would have said, like it said in English, the translation was a cute boy or a cute guy, which would be, oops. Söt, söt kille. And that's not the same. Snygg is, I would say, in English, it would be either hot, if they were speaking between friends, but it's a dad who says it to his son. So I think it would have been better to say either gorgeous or Beautiful. The word cute in English. You can use that for an animal as well. You can't say snig for an animal. Snig is a specific, like, it's a very good looking person. It's a very, as I said, if you're speaking between friends, you probably use hot. And I think good looking. In this case, with snig, I think hot, gorgeous, or beautiful would be better suited. Good looking works, but you would be better to say se bra ut. So this is just like, a little note. I feel like I should mention that this is not typical for upper secondary school to have an initiation this extreme. In Swedish, this is called noll ning. That's because this means zero. It's because when you start upper secondary school or university, you are a nolla. So nolla, that's why it's called nollning. It's because you very new, so you are a nolla. No one says nolla usually, but it's called nollning because of that. It's not usually this extreme. I just wanna say that like, if you're thinking about going to upper secondary school in Sweden, or you know someone who might and you watch this and you're like, oh shit, you don't have to be worried because this usually does not happen. Don't worry about this. I just wanna say that. The question that they asked is Trivs du här? So Trivs du här? This is the question that they ask. So Trivas is to at Trivas. It is the verb and it's basic. So as in like in English you have to walk, walk, walks, walking, you know, that kind of thing. So to walk is the basic form of the verb. Trivas is the basic verb. And here it's trivs du här, but it's trivas. Or you can also say känna trevnad, but känna trevnad, or specifically trevnad, it's very old fashioned. No one would say, like, no one would use that term, but it's also nice to know. Trevnad became trivas. And trivas is a feeling of comfort or satisfaction in one's surrounding. It can be both like the physical surrounding like you feel like you like you you feel a comfort and satisfaction in your area in your house but it can also be social like with the people you're around okay that was the first episode then we will start the second episode Okay, this is definitely another thing that I want to talk a little bit about. This is also extremely uncommon uh, today in upper secondary schools. This is also like something that is, I can understand it in this kind of setting that is a lot more traditional, I would say. 
this is not normal in upper secondary schools in Sweden. First of all, like, if you have a teacher, you use their first name to address them. Unless there are multiple people at the school with the same first name and all of them are in the staff, then you use the last name or a nickname. But you, you don't say, like, magister, which is a male teacher, or fröken, which is a female teacher. You don't use them anymore, unless it's in a very, like, traditional school. I don't think my students know what my last name is. Everyone would say Kevin. No one would say, you know, Mr. and something. No one would say Mrs. and something. It's first name. You only use first names unless... As I said, there are multiple people with the same first name, then you may use a last name for one of them. What I mean is, we're on a first name basis with teachers and students. And you, singular you, is used for teachers in Swedish. We have two words for you. So the English word you in Swedish is er, which is plural, or du, which is singular. We also have ni, which is plural. This depends on what situation. I am talking to you. Jag pratar med er. Dig. So the word you in English is plural plus singular. You can say singular you or you can say plural you. Meaning like I speak to you specifically or I speak to you as a whole. Um, in Swedish, if we would say like I'm talking to you. Jag pratar med dig if it's only one person. And jag pratar med er if it's multiple people. You are talking to me. Du pratar med mig or ni pratar med mig. Those are like the differences. Ni and er as singular are extremely like formal, not common in Sweden to use those words to someone. In some circles, it is the way that you should use them. But it's incredibly, incredibly uncommon. And they are used to like... If you talk to someone who is a member of the royal family, you would probably use these two in singular form, but usually you use them in plural form. So in Swedish, we would use you as in they and du, the more, you know, common one that is seen as more informal, but it's the normal way to say it today. When I say normal, I mean like no one would bat an eye or, you know, frown at you if you would say it that way instead of the other way. So the informal way is the natural, normal way to say it now. And er, ni, as, as a singular, is strange today unless it's in specific circles. We use do, they, speaking to teachers. I am not above my students, there's no hierarchy that way. They have to respect me, but they don't have to like treat me as if I'm on a different rank than them. So the whole thing like Mr, Mrs, Miss, Magister, Fröken aren't in use in uh, uh, ordinary schools in Sweden. I would be very surprised if I ever have a student who would refer to me that way, uh, who would not use my first name to address me. I would be very surprised. I've only used Magister for one teacher and he was an older teacher. He was almost retired. So he was used to like working as a teacher for 40 years. You are used to having that word. And this was in the beginning of the 2000s. That's like because he was so old and it was still early 2000s. It was normal or more normal. But he's the only teacher I've ever called Magister. And that's also the only time I've ever referred to a female teacher as fröken. Never since then. Oh, and the stand behind your chair when the teacher comes in. Not in use. Also, I think in more traditional schools. I have personally never heard of it. I've never heard of this happening in a school today in Sweden. But I can understand if it happens in more traditional schools, more conservative schools, um, schools that have a clearer connection to, to like traditional values and maybe also religious values, uh, which fits this boarding school very well. But as I said, this is not common in Swedish upper secondary schools or any school in Sweden. It's it's not common um, at all to have it like this. Okay, I, I feel like this is another thing that I should maybe comment on. I know that the most famous royal house today is the British royal house. 
I think in Great Britain, you would refer to the king or the queen as your majesty. But in Sweden, it's more common to say the title. So in this case, he says the prince did not instead of saying your highness did not or, you know, your majesty did not He says the prince did not He likes creates a distance between himself and the prince, the member of the royal family, because the member of the royal family is above him. So it's the prince in that kind of way. And also, as he said with the words, er and ni are the words that you use for members of the royal family. You use the formal you, the formal singular you, which makes it sound as if they're plural, but it's, you know, a formal singular you that you use for members of the royal family. Never use this word for a member of the royal family. Oh my god! Ah, okay. Um, this is another thing that I... Th um, okay, okay, we... These are the grades in Sweden. A, B, C, D, E, and F. F is the only one that is not... You know, you did not pass. If you didn't pass, it's an F. If you passed, you got an E. So this is just passing. This is passing plus. It's passing and it's a little bit better than just passing. And then you have this, which is kind of well done. Okay, I will use, in English now, I will use more descriptive words to explain it. So passing, good. No, okay. No one is happy with an E unless you're aiming for an E and you, you just, you don't want to fail the course. So this is just fail. And if you pass, it's an, it's an okay grade. If you want high grades, you're definitely aiming for at least a C. So this is okay and this is good. This is great. This is well done. And this is very well done. So it's kind of like this as a basic way of seeing it. I know that in America you don't have the grade E, if I remember correctly, but this is kind of like a simplified way of seeing the grades. But the interesting thing is that there is no criteria for B or D. So D is if you're between an E or and a C, then you get a D. If you're between a C and an A, then you get the B. And I'm reacting to this because he gave her a B plus. And um, I... Mm, we we are technically not allowed to rather we are advised against giving pluses because the reason we have this grading system now i'm going full teacher here we used to have ig g vg and mvg so i don't know how well you can see it so ig icke godkänt fail g godkänt passing vg väl godkänt more than passing. MVG a lot more than pas passing. It's mycket väl godkänt. And because it was like this first, so IG and F are basically the same. But when a student was between G and VG, they got G plus or VG minus. And in order to kind of take away the pluses and minuses, we changed to this system to not have pluses and minuses. And that's why I'm reacting to him giving the grade B+. Plus. Because, as I said, we've been advised as teachers to not give that grade. But I do think that the reason he gave the grade B+, plus is because he's of the old school, which is when you used VG, MVG, G, and IG. My assumption is, I think that this teacher specifically um, graduated from the teacher program a lot um, earlier than I did. And he probably was teaching while we had the old system IG to MVG, meaning that, that it was more common to give pluses and minuses. If you had, for example, a grade that was G minus, that means that you're very, very close to not passing, but you just passed. So I think that he's used to doing pluses and minuses. So that's, I, I think that's why he did B plus, even though we shouldn't use those grades in Swedish. So that's, as a teacher, I just reacted to that. Yeah, 
the upper and the pruvihog stabi. So here he says, I used to have straight A's on every test. That's the translation. But in actuality, he said, Jag brukade ha A på alla prov i högstadiet, which is this. We have primary school in Sweden. So grundskolan is primary school. And then you go to lågstadiet, which you can refer to as low, lower stage, the lower stage school. And we have, sometimes you use middle school for it or middle stage. Wait, I should do like this instead. So like that. And then högstadiet, the thing that he just mentioned, you should not use high school for that because that can confuse with the American high school, which it's not comparable to. It should be upper stage school, but I do know that some refer to it as junior high, but I think junior high is more to make it understandable by Americans more, but it's, you should use lower stage, middle stage, and upper stage. You can use middle stage school, but lower school, I don't think many people would like, that sounds weird. So lower stage school, middle school, or middle stage school, and then upper stage school. It's also to not confuse with American and British terms for the school, the different stages of school, while also keeping it true to what it is in Swedish. But he mentioned Högstadiet, which is upper stage school and högstadiet is grade 7, 7 to 9. Then you can refer to this as 10 to 13 to 12, I mean. So this is kind of how it works. So lågstadiet year 1 to 3, mellanstadiet 4 to 6, högstadiet 7 to 9. So in högstadiet, so in upper stage school, he got straight A's. And I just want to like make that distinction because the translation here, the subtitles, I used to have straight A's on every test, make it sound as if before now he had straight A's and then suddenly he didn't. But what he's saying is that in Hug studied in upper stage school, grade seven to nine, he had A's, straight A's on every test. And then when he started gymnasiet, which is upper secondary school, which is Hileshka, this is when he did not get straight A's anymore. So he used to get it in upper stage school, but now he doesn't. The subtitles makes it sound as if he used to get it during upper secondary school, when in actuality he got it in upper stage school. I think it should go without saying by this point. This is not common. Teachers don't commonly take bribes or, you know, get paid to give extra lessons. That is unethical and no, 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 um, no. It's definitely not normalized the way it is here. If a student needs private lessons, it is free. You don't pay to have more time with the teacher. The class, ethnicity, it's really in Europe. Okay, I feel like I should mention something here. And this, I think, shocks um, people, especially if you are from the US. And probably, actually, if you're from anywhere, I think, apart from Sweden. It's that it's more common in other parts of the world to talk about race. Like here, he said that it doesn't matter class, age, ethnicity. It's because we don't use race. Race is not a word that we use. This is, it looks very harsh. Um, we don't use the word race in Sweden. It was abolished as a term in 2014. And when I say abolished, I mean, it was taken out of legal documents and stuff like that. You can technically not be discriminated against in Sweden based on race because the concept of race was abolished. That's kind of what it means. And the reason for that is because the term race is, is considered racist. As a word, race was considered racist, and that's why it was taken away from. That's why it was abolished, basically. So the word that we use is ethnicity instead. And I have heard that not everyone who used the word race understand ethnicity. So what ethnicity means is that it's a group of people who have a specific connection to either a culture or a place. So you can talk about ethnically Swedish if you have um, a connection to the Swedish land, 
and the culture, geographically speaking, when I say land. This can also be mentioned like being Jewish is considered to be an ethnicity if you're Jewish by birth. Being Sami, meaning our indigenous people, is also considered an ethnicity. So I am ethnically Swedish and German. So you can consider me like ethnically Northern and Central European. And if you're from a specific country, you can be ethnically something. But you can also be ethnically European. So even though I am ethnically Nordic, because I'm Swedish, I am also ethnically white European and Northern European, like all of those things. So there is a difference between race and ethnicity, but we don't use the word race. There is another thing that I should mention with the word race, because in Swedish, we have one word, ras. And the thing with ras is that it both means race, but it also means breed. And so what this means is that I could say that my cat has a specific breed. I would use this in English, but in Swedish, I would use this. And because of that, if you say that a human has a race, you use the same word. It's kind of like if I would say that you have a different breed than me. You are of a different breed. It makes it sound like I'm talking about an animal, right? It sounds like I am minimizing this human into an animal and that in itself is extremely racist. And so because we only have one word, which is a word that we don't normally use, when you say this word about a person, it sounds as if you're making this person an animal. And that is another issue that we have with the word race. So, okay, those were the two episodes, the two first episodes of Young Royals. I hope that you learned something um, and that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't. Comment down below what you thought, if any other Swedish shows or anything that you want me to react to or discuss or anything like that. And please let me know if you want a part two of this where I would then react to episode three and four. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a good day. Goodbye.